Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last couple of lectures of EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, we computed some discrete time Fourier transform pairs. In this lecture, we'll look at some DTFT properties. The DTFT gives us a frequency domain representation of discrete time signals. We've seen that if you take the Fourier transform of a system's impulse response, it gives you the frequency response. Now, there's a little caveat here in that the DTFT has to exist in the usual sense. Now, in the course of your work, you generally don't have to compute a Fourier transform or an inverse Fourier transform from scratch. Usually, you have a table of pairs of Fourier transforms and another table with a bunch of Fourier transform properties, and you can find the transform you need for your particular example by combining the right pairs with the right properties. And you need to be able to effectively move back and forth between the time domain and the frequency domain to answer whatever question you need answered. So far, we've seen that an impulse in time corresponds to a complex sinusoid in frequency. As far as the special case of delta of n goes, that just transforms to a constant 1. We also found the Fourier transform of a right-sided decaying exponential. And remember, for it to be decaying, the magnitude of a needs to be less than 1. In the last lecture, we saw that a discrete time sync function has a Fourier transform that's a boxcar in frequency. If x was like little h, an impulse response, and big x was big h, a frequency response, this would be an ideal brick wall low pass filter. We also looked at the Fourier transform of a boxcar in time and found that it gave this sync like formula. Instead of having sign just in the numerator, it has sign in the numerator and the denominator. Now notice there's an interesting relationship here. We have something sync-like turning into something boxcar-like, and something boxcar-like turning into something sync-like. There's a bunch of differences in the details, but the overall vibe from here to here and the vibe from here to here is similar. That's not a coincidence. The first property we're going to prove is conjugate symmetry. If x is real valued, it's equal to its own complex conjugate, since the complex conjugate flips the imaginary part, and there's no imaginary part if it's real valued. Now, for a moment, forgetting about this assumption, let's just say we took the Fourier transform of the complex conjugate of x of n. Complex conjugation is a really nice operation because it distributes over addition and multiplication. So I can basically pull out the complex conjugate by taking the complex conjugate of this x star of n, which gives me just x of n, and taking the complex conjugate of e to the minus j omega hat n, which would give me a plus here, which I'll write as a minus j with a minus omega hat here. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like x e to the j omega hat with minus omega hat plugged in for omega hat. And then remember that we have this complex conjugate sitting out here. Now, we've developed a generic property for finding the Fourier transform of x complex conjugate. But if we assume that x is equal to x complex conjugate, then we get this property here. We'll prove a few more properties. The first will be linearity. I've probably already used this property implicitly in a couple of the previous lectures. Another property is that a delay in time corresponds to this multiplication by a complex exponential in frequency. And that makes sense because that corresponds to a phase shift. We'll also see that multiplying in time by a complex sinusoid e to the j omega hat cn corresponds to shifting the Fourier transform to the right by omega hat c. Note that even if x of n is real, y of n is now a complex valued signal. We generally deal with real valued signals in this class, so I wanted to call that out. Because y is complex valued, the Fourier transform of y doesn't have conjugate symmetry. Let's first prove linearity. I have the Fourier transform of little x of 1 the Fourier transform of little x of 2. And now let's place 
this AX1 plus BX2 into the Fourier transform formula. I can pull the complex exponent into the parentheses and pull the sum into the parentheses to write it as these two sums. And then, of course, A pulls out in front of here and B pulls out in front of here. And I'm left with these forms for the transforms. So scaling and adding signals in time corresponds to scaling and adding their Fourier transforms. Now let's prove the delay property. We'll plug x n minus nd into the Fourier transform formula. Now let's imagine sticking a 1 in front and rewriting that 1 as e to the minus j omega hat nd times e to the plus j omega hat nd. And that e to the plus j omega hat nd I'll rewrite in here as e to the minus j omega hat times minus nd. Now we can do a change of variable in the sum and write n minus nd as m and say, oh, this looks an awful lot like the Fourier transform of x. And now I have this e to the minus j omega hat nd sitting next to it. So a delay in the time domain corresponds to a change of phase in the frequency domain. Now, I should mention that that's just one way to prove this time delay property. You could take this Fourier transform here and shove that into the inverse Fourier transform and do some manipulations. Let's work at an example where we use these properties. Here we want to take the Fourier transform of a signal that has a series of n naught ones followed by a series of n naught minus ones. Notice that we could write this signal using a simpler kind of signal, namely a series of ones. So we could write it as a series of n not ones minus a series of n not ones with a subtraction here, where the second series here has been shifted to land at n not. So in the last lecture, we saw that this kind of boxcar function had this kind of Fourier transform where this is sometimes referred to as an aliased sink or a digital sink or a Dirichlet kernel. So I can take the Fourier transform of this function using two properties. One is the linearity property. That's pretty obvious. And the other is the shift property. So here I have e to the minus j omega hat and not from the shift. Let's factor out big X. So I can write the Fourier transform of my function as this business, that's the Fourier transform of x, times this 1 minus e to the minus j and not omega hat factor. And notice that I could use this much more generally. I could put other kinds of big x's here associated with other kinds of little x's. The magnitude plot of this particular Fourier transform for the case of n not equals 4 looks like this. Now we're plotting this slightly different than usual. Usually we plot this between minus pi and pi, but here we're plotting it between 0 and 2 pi. Same information. Notice that the Fourier transform is 0 at a frequency of 0, and that makes sense because if you look at the impulse response here and add it up, you get 0. So let's take a look at this frequency shift property. We'll take this e to the j omega hat c n times x of n and plug it in to the Fourier transform formula. We can combine the exponentials here and wind up with something that looks a whole lot like the Fourier transform of x with omega hat minus omega c plugged in for our usual omega hat. Now, this is just one way to prove it. Another way to prove it would be to take this big X e to the j omega hat minus omega hat c and plug that into the inverse Fourier transform formula and then do some manipulations that would look like the manipulations we performed when proving the time delay property. This property is handy because it lets us move things around in the spectral domain. Let's see what happens in the Fourier domain if you take a time domain function and multiply it by a cosine. Instead of taking this and plugging it into the Fourier transform formula as we have with the previous properties, we can just use the properties we've already derived. 
We can rewrite the cosine using the inverse Euler's formula, and then we can use that frequency shift property on the e to the j omega c n term, which gives us this minus omega c, and this e to the minus j omega hat c n term, where the minus here cancels with the minus in the property to give me a plus here. So you wind up with a copy of the Fourier transform shifted to the right, and a copy of the Fourier transform shifted to the left. Oh, and don't forget to divide by two. So I wind up with a copy at omega c hat and one at minus omega c hat. Let's consider an example where xn is a cosine with the frequency of omega naught hat. We could also write it using the inverse Euler's formula. Now, talking about the Fourier transform of this is a little bit tricky. I previously mentioned that for the discrete time Fourier transform to exist, x of n needed to be absolutely summable. Here, this goes on for infinity, so it's definitely not. I probably should have said something like exist as an ordinary function. We can't talk about its Fourier transform, but we have to open our minds to something called a generalized function. The arrows shown here are what are referred to as Dirac delta functions. These are very strange things that we talk about in detail in EC 3084, and we don't have the machinery to talk about it in depth here. For our purposes here, just know that the discrete time Fourier transform of this cosine has a little happy arrow at omega dot hat and another happy arrow at minus omega dot hat. I'm not going to worry about what the exact coefficients on here are. That gets complicated. Now when I take this cosine with this frequency of omega naught hat and multiply it with this cosine with the frequency of omega c hat, and I should mention in this example, I'm assuming that omega c hat is bigger than omega naught hat. I get one copy of this pair of lines up here at omega c hat and another copy down here at minus omega c hat. And whatever coefficients I had in front get multiplied by a half. And I should mention you might need to watch out for some weirdness happening with that 2 pi periodicity. Now the reason I went through this particular example, even though I had to do some hand waving about delta functions, is we've already done it. We looked at this sort of thing in a much earlier lecture when we talked about amplitude modulation. In that lecture we were looking at continuous time signals, not discrete time signals, but the same idea still applies. We were able to compute results for sinusoids without any fancy Fourier transform theory, just by manipulating complex exponentials and algebraic expressions. The whole point of introducing discrete time Fourier transforms is now that we can play games where our signals are much more complicated than a sum of a finite number of sinusoids. In EC3084, we cover a continuous time version of this property. Before we close out, I wanted to point out some quasi-symmetry that you've probably already noticed. A shift in time corresponded to a multiplication by a complex exponential in frequency, and a shift in frequency corresponded to a multiplication by a complex exponential in time. Now the symmetry is not exact. These shifts are both to the right, but the minus sign in the exponent up here contrast with the plus sign in the exponent over here. This kind of quasi-symmetry shouldn't be terribly surprising if you spend some time staring at the forward transform and the inverse transform.